Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Different, and I am the Director of Programming for the ACT Human Rights Film Festival. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the writer, director, and producer of Into the Weeds, Jennifer Baitual. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Um, I am a, a fan of your work. I've been a fan for many years, um, having seen a few of your previous documentaries. I saw your 2009 feature, Act of God, which is, you know, about people who have been struck by lightning and among other things. And probably your most famous uh, feature, Manufactured Landscapes, which is about a lot of things, of course, but it, primarily I would say it's about environmental and human costs of modern industry. You've made many more shorts and features besides those leading up to Into the Weeds. So I just wanted to sort of kick off our questions by asking you first a little bit about your background as a filmmaker. Um, what led you down this path and why in particular has the documentary form been your, you know, your primary means of exploring some fairly weighty and even philosophical subjects? Uh, what, what really draws you to documentary and how did you start that journey? Well, that's interesting because I, um, I started off as an academic. I did a, a, an undergraduate degree in philosophy and religious studies and then a master's in theology. And I was, I'm not boasting, but I got scholarships for my master's. And so all my professors just assumed that I was going to, you know, become a teacher and do a PhD. And I just started to feel constrained by the form of inquiry in academic work. It felt like it was narrow. It felt like you know, how many people read my thesis? Three people, my dad, my professor and the outside reader kind of thing. And so I was looking for a form of inquiry that was more accessible while still really being preoccupied with the questions that I had studied in school, questions of ethics and metaphysics and epistemology and, and you know, the human condition essentially. And so, I learned to make films by doing. I did not go to film school. I, in fact, the film, Looking in the Back of the Head, which is over there, is the first film I made with a, a Canada Council grant that didn't require any previous experience. And I made it with a friend and I basically kind of learned from making that film. And once I started doing it, I realized that I'd found my vocation, that there was just something about this combination of visual language and text or information in a time-based medium that was very powerful. And I still am fascinated by it. So I'm, I'm glad that I found something that I really love to do. And also that it, it's now, um, you know, I'm not as poor as a church mouse doing it uh, anymore <laughs> as, as, as we were when we started. And I work with my husband, also self-taught, um, and we've been making films together for almost 30 years now. I'm curious, I, I rarely ask other documentarians this question, but I was curious to hear, how do you think over the span of those years that you've been making films, you've sort of improved, or how have you changed as a documentarian? What what skills do you think you've honed over the years? Well, I, I mean, one of the things that really bothered me when I started was how in sort of conventional documentary, visual language was always subordinate to text. It was always used as a backup. And to me, film is a visual medium. And so uh, I wanted the, the language of film. Um, the language of shots, the rhythm of, of our films to be, to lead visually, to be compelling visually, and then to have a much more um, organic and dialectical uh, relationship between text and visual language. And then also to be aware that this is unfolding in time. Like when the, the three films that are behind me that we did with the photographer Ed Bertinsky, um, it was very much a question of how do you convey photography uh, and the meaning of, of Ed's work in a time-based medium. And 
And how do you do it in a way that doesn't fall into the tropes of, you know, films about artists, like the, you know, the thoughtful walking away scene, the dark room scene, like all of that stuff. Um, how do you do that? How do you kind of immerse yourself in that work um, in a way that makes sense in film? So I feel like I've gotten a bit better at um, that rhythm and 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 also, that I, I wouldn't say that there are thematic things that happen in all of our films or this idea of a style. I don't get it because I feel like the style comes from the content. It's always very much about, um, in a way, form following function or form following content for me. Uh, but I've I've learned in some ways to hone more this relationship between scale and detail as a way of giving a full picture of a, of a context, a situation, or um, uh, a person. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the word ethics, and, and I know from your previous interviews that the ethics of engagement really sort of weigh heavily on your mind as a documentarian who, you know, you're obviously trying to respect your subject's right to privacy, but you're also trying to or seeking to facilitate a kind of openness and sharing so that a you know a stronger empathetic or just intersubjective relationship between the person on screen and the audience sitting in the auditorium or at home might be achieved you're trying to make a connection it seems to me and i'm just curious were there ever any moments when you were making into the weeds um, when you sort of had to take a moment to reflect on whether or not certain footage should be included or excluded? How how much was that really weighing on your mind? Well, absolutely. And just back to the ethics of engagement. I mean, essentially, I have always believed that it's, it's already um, uh, an invasive act to point a camera in somebody's face. There's something aggressive about that. And uh, the other part of that is the films that I have made with my husband and others have taken us all over the world. So there's a couple of <laughs> issues there. One is the carbon footprint worth the message like that. That's something that keeps me awake at night. Hi. Um, and secondly, um, this idea of how could you possibly think that you could convey anything of truth about a context that you are not of. Right. And and so that is also part of the ethics of engagement. And I feel like I've, um, you know, our filmmaking style that has also evolved over the years is very open. Like we do a ton of research before we get into the field. Like I'm talking about one to two years of research. Anthropocene was two years of research. Um, meeting with the scientists, learning the issues, then then thinking about how to translate these into a form that most people can understand. Um, and then as soon as we get into the field, it, just forget about everything. Like I've, I don't have a shot list. I don't have, like somebody said to me once, what's the beat, where's your beat sheet? And I said, what is a beat sheet? Like, I don't even know what that is. And I, because without total humility and openness when you're entering into these contexts you will not be able to know them or convey them uh, in 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 a way that is true so in the case of into the weeds um you know lee originally really was not interested in being the poster as he said the poster child for for glyphosate and I knew from the very beginning that he was an incredibly empathetic, strong, brave character. And we we just kept talking about it uh, to the point where it, it eventually created this relationship of trust. And, and the way that that relationship of trust gets, gets developed is through a mutual exchange of vulnerability. It's not about, you know, um, trust me, because then I'm going to run with it. Like, it's not that. It's about having a real, authentic relationship of, of empathy and respect. And by the end of that, there were scenes that were quite difficult that even our broadcaster questioned whether we should take out. And he asked us to film those things. He wanted people to know how hard it was just to get up in the morning and start the day. And um, the way that we film those those 
scenes. Um, there's a there's quite an intimate scene in a hotel room. Nick was there alone. I was not there. We talked about it before. Um, the way that we film it is one thing, and then allowing him to comment on it and approve it before we finalize the cut. So the, those are to me, it's sort of the only way to do it, really. Um, and uh, uh, I'm I keep learning as a filmmaker um, those the complexities of those relationships and how the ethics are I get like still the very the most important thing in the work that we do. Well, I think I I think audiences would be upset if I didn't ask this question. I would be remiss if I didn't ask how how he's doing, if you have any updates on on Lee's health or just even the outcome of the trial. We we sort of get some evidence that the the um the monetary <laughs> the outcome of the trial uh, sort of was reduced over time. Could you give us a little bit more information about him and the trial? Yeah, so the I mean, what's interesting the the, the film on a I would say on a meta level is looking at the bigger issues, the, the repercussions of systemic pesticide use, the limitations of mass torts as a tool for justice, the issue of agency capture, where the regulatory agencies that are meant to protect us are in fact, in some way, almost working for the chemical companies that that they are meant to regulate. And, and that's a, a very known phenomenon, you know, um, and and so those are the bigger picture things. And then the 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 particularities of Lee's story. I mean, one of the things that just shocked me the most was when he got fired from his job because he was too sick to work, he lost his health care. So he couldn't be treated for a quite a long period of time because he couldn't afford it. And so that's when he got really, really ill. And now that the settlement has um, gone through, uh, he he is able to take care of his health on a maintenance level um, of, of chemotherapy that keeps him from really, truly suffering. Uh, he can't be healed. He can't, you know, he'll never get completely better, but he's well enough now that he can do some of the things that he wants to. So, for example, we were just in in Brussels two weeks ago screening the film for European Parliament and he came and that was incredible. Like that was that was really um, amazing. And regarding the limitations of mass torts, like what what happens and is that nobody would be able to afford to take these one of these mal massive multinational corporations to court on their own it just so mass torts are about you know different law firms getting together what they call multi-district litigation the executive group of this mdl and they all put in the research money so even getting lee's case to trial costs millions of dollars so they put that up and and if they win, then they get a percentage of that. But what always happens is that almost always is that the judge reduces the um, damages that the jury awards because there's punitive damages and comp compensatory damages. The compensatory damages are for what actual income you have lost. The punitive are, are, are intended to punish the corporation for the malfeasance of their actions. And um, those almost those inevitably get reduced, but you know he still got some money and he's doing all right. And um, uh, it's great to see him uh, not just intensely, intensely suffering as he was when we were making the film. Uh, we are unfortunately running a, a little bit short of time, but I do have one final question, or I guess. Before I go, I want to just say just how impressive it is. This must have been a Herculean effort on your part. Um, I think when people sit down and watch a, a documentary for two hours, they don't often reflect on just how much effort and time goes into making something like this. And the number, of, I can't imagine how many hours you poured over those legal documents and the court documents. And and I, you know, that alone is, is significant. Um, but I'm, I, I wanted to end by asking you about the impact that this film might have. Um, whether it's had, had any impact that you can see or what impact you'd like to see it make. Uh, you know, this film debuted, I guess, about a year ago at the Hot Docs Film Festival in Canada, and uh, it's gone on to play at other festivals, as you mentioned. Um, do you think that 
Into the Weeds has already contributed to greater public awareness of the effects of products like Roundup on human and animal lives? And, and I guess as just a final wrinkle to that question, do you think that, you know, with food costs rising, especially here in the United States and the U.S. government rolling back on food assistance programs, that the, the momentum, the earlier public momentum to ban gly glyphosate has stalled or slowed down in any, any way? Well, okay, that's a complicated question, and I'll try to be succinct um, in the sense that, okay, number one, um, this is the first film that we've had a really robust impact campaign for, and our other films are more, they're more reflective, they're meditative, they're they're about, you know, getting you to a point of, of shifting consciousness by witnessing places you're responsible for but would never normally see. This is a much different film, hence the um, form follows content idea. It's very, it's very much a political film. It is a, a an account of a kind of David versus Goliath moment um, in history. And I will say that given the, you probably already know about something called errors and emissions insurance that filmmakers have to get before they show their films. And you can imagine the meticulous fact checking that we did and our lawyers did to make sure that every single claim made in the film is backed up by evidence or by, it was like writing a PhD. I mean, we have all of these citations and I, I wanted to do that. So this is not a Michael Moore polemic. This is a this is a very carefully researched and backed up film. So I, I, I stand by everything that is in the film that way. But we have already, we we screen for EU Parliament. You know, the, we're at an inflection point um, in terms of regulation around the world. The EU is voting by the end of the year whether to renew glyphosate. As you probably already know, the U.S. has vacated its um, opinion about glyphosate uh, and is being forced to review both from a biodiversity and a carcinogenicity perspective. So that is something that we're following closely. And as our film gets released in the U.S., we will really be um, trying to target these regulatory agencies and have these kinds of screenings. Um, we screened in the EU two weeks ago. Next week, I'm going to present a petition to Parliament that, that calls for an immediate review of pesticide use in Canada and a ban of glyphosate. We're, we're presenting that. It's a parliamentary petition. We're advocating uh, all the time. And it's actually, in a way, kind of a relief to be openly political about something. I will say that when the film was being made, all of our partners kept it a secret. So we said we were making a film on global insect collapse and nobody knew what it was really about until the press release for Hot Docs went out that it was opening the festival about three weeks before the screening. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking time to talk to our audience and we wish you the very best. We're so honored to have included Into the Weeds in our festival here in Fort Collins. We wish you the very best. We know you have a lot of things coming up, probably other projects on your on your mind as well. Could you just give us a little hint about what's after you sort of move to the next stage, the next film project, what that might be? Without <laughs> spoiling it, could you guys? No, no, I'm, I'm sort of we're we're engaged in a bunch of smaller projects, artist projects that are are kind of a nice counterpoint to the to the big mm -hmm. picture one, and then um, yeah, there's a couple of things I can't talk about them yet, but I will when I'm when I'm ready. But I'm I'm very sorry I can't be there in person, and let, let's remember the carbon saved by me not coming in person and. Um, uh, I hope it's a great screening. Thank you for having the film and for having me. Thank you so much and have a great day. Take care. Take care.